Good evening. In keeping with the theme of tonight, I was thinking about that when you folks are giving your testimonies and honestly the message that I have I to bring tonight and I've also asked for next Sunday night as well. Really it was a message that was born out of conviction of God in my own heart. Um, what does walking by faith look like? What does repentance look like in the life of a believer? Should it be a pattern of our lives? Um, what does yielding look like? What is surrendering to God? And folks, um, there will be some strong medicine in this, tonight's message and next week. But remember, this is something that I'm preaching to myself. Um, you know, it was something where, like I said, was born out of conviction, and I wanted God to show me what that looked like. So let's open in a word of prayer. Eternal God, our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight. And Father, I pray with all my heart that your spirit would work in, in this building tonight, that your word would invade and, and permeate the lives of those that hear it, and that you would apply it to lives tonight. And Father, bring us to a closer relationship with you. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So, um, a few weeks ago, or maybe a few months ago, I, I gave a message on Leviticus and what atonement meant, and, um, and I want to, this is actually uh, kind of a continuation of that message. So a quick refresher and review of, our, of my previous message from the book of Leviticus. We know that the author of Leviticus was Moses. And we see the interpretation of the law after Israel's experience in the wilderness. And we see mankind's defilement, uh, corruption and destruction because of sin. And we see that in Leviticus chapter 11 when God says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves and you shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And then in verse, in chapter 15, Thus shall ye separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, that they die not in their uncleanness, when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. The book of Leviticus also teaches us, teaches us that the way to God is by sacrifice. And we saw that from Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Leviticus 17.11 says this, For the life is of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And we learned that atonement was an Old Testament word, which means to cover up or to cover over. And it also means that the blood of goats and bulls can never take away sin. Rather, sin was covered over until Jesus Christ came to take sin away, including sins of the past. And we saw that in Romans 3.25. Romans 3.25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through the faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And then that very familiar verse where John the Baptist said this, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He didn't come to cover it. We also saw the awfulness of sin, and the great price that was to be paid for redemption and sanctification. And that's a big word, but it means to be set apart. Sanctification means to be set apart. And we saw great pictures of Jesus Christ as the spotless Lamb of God who is the only one that can redeem and sanctify. The only one. And finally, we looked at the matter of, and this is where I want to focus, we looked at the matter of being clean, that is holy, or set apart unto God. We saw that in Leviticus chapter 20. In verse 26, the Bible says, 
And ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. In this matter of holy living, like I said, and being set apart unto God is where I want to focus tonight. But before we begin, we must first understand that access to God is secured for the sinner through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews 9.12, Hebrews 9.12 says this, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And then Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 says this, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So now that we've reviewed the outline of Leviticus, and understand that access to God is secured for the sinner through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we can focus on the matter of being clean and holy and set apart unto God. And that is a walk with God that is sanctified, and we want to see how that applies to the child of God today. So turn with me, if you will, to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians chapter 2, we'll use that as a starting place. And um, I do like to use scripture to back up scripture. So um, I will do that tonight. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10 says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we tend to stop there. But verse 10 says this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. A Christian is one who is saved by the grace of God through faith unto good works. Now don't get that backwards. We're not saved by good works. We're saved by the grace of God through faith unto good works. We all need to understand that. And having been saved by the grace of God through faith, the child of God must also walk by faith and live a separated life unto God in order to enjoy and worship Him. We find that in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And then we'll turn to Titus. Ephesians 5, verse 2. And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And then Titus chapter 2, verse 14 says this, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify himself a peculiar people, we listen, zealous, of good works. Zealous of good works. Now, before we go any further, it's important to understand that God does not promise to make the Christian happy. In fact, the Christian living in sin will be absolutely miserable. Joy is a result of walking by faith, holy that is separate before God. So turn with me to, to Philippians chapter 4. This is a very familiar verse. You all probably can stand and give it. But it says this, Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And it's implied, that phrase, in the Lord, at the end of the verse. So if we read that again, it says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice in the Lord. And Romans 15 verse 13 says this. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And that phrase 
in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost in Romans 5.13 describes a walk of faith for the child of God. In fact, we must trust the Holy Spirit to do for us what we cannot do. Listen to Paul in Romans chapter 8. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. It's important for the Apostle Paul went through this struggle. Romans chapter 8, I'll start reading in verse 2. Romans 8 verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Paul is the one who once said in the previous chapter in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now Paul introduces the Spirit of God in Romans chapter 8. That's the difference. God wants to make the Christian holy, separate, set apart, sanctified to himself. In fact, God's desire to perform a good work in the Christian and the Christian's faithful obedience, they're inseparable. They're inseparable. Remember the words of the song that we all sang and learned in Sunday school. These words couldn't be more true. Trust and obey. When we walk in the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds in our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You see, God's part is to conform his children to the image of his son. Turn with me to Romans 8.29. Romans 8.29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of who? His Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm 138. Psalm 138, verse 8. The Lord will be perfect, Psalm 138, verse 8, The Lord will be perfect, which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. A familiar passage to many of you, I'm sure. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. How about Philippians 1, 6? Philippians 1, 6 says this. Being confident of this very thing, that he which be, hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Will do it. Now, our part, our part, 
is to keep the Lord's commandments and to walk by faith. Turn with me to 1 John. 1 John, New Testament, near the back, before the book of 2 and 3 John, before Revelation. 1 John, chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 2, our part. By this we know that we love him, the children of God, when we love God, and what? Keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. What does it say? Even our faith. Even our faith. So we see here that the Christian's walk is one of faith and trust in God. Turn with me to John 14, 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 14, verse 15. Short verse, but a very powerful verse. This is our Lord speaking. If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Turn over one chapter to John 15, verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Folks, faith is not a leap in the dark. It's trusting in the promises given to us in God's word. And we can trust that. Do you believe that? John 15, 14. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. Read along as I read out loud. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He saith that I know him, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a what? Is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. Folks, I believe that a great many Christians today doubt their salvation because they do not trust and obey. In fact... That verse in 1 John chapter 2 implies that the Christian cannot be happy and continually live in sin. And if you're living in sin, God won't let you be happy. He's, God is working to conform you in the image of his son. And there will, there will come a point that one must say, I will arise and go to my father. And if you can't be happy, if you, I have to say this. If you can be happy and continually live in sin, then we need to face up to it. You need to seriously examine yourself to see if you're even in the faith. First or Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove yourselves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Now, I suppose the classic example of that is found in a parable in Luke chapter 15. So turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son. Luke 15, starting in verse 11. 
I'm going to paraphrase it. You read along. It starts in verse 11 where, and, and goes through verse 24. The parable given to us in Luke 15 tells us that a certain man had two sons. The younger son said, Father, give me my share of the money that I am to have when you die. So the father divided his wealth between his two sons. The younger son packed his things and went on a long journey to a distant land. And at first, he had many friends to enjoy the money with. But he spent all on selfish, riotous, wild living. And about this time, what happened? A famine in the land, right? A famine in the land came and the young man became hungry. But his friends, um, when his money was spent, his friends were gone too. His friends, his friends. And he found a job tending hogs for a farmer. And the young man still was hungry. He didn't have enough to eat. And he wished that someone would even give him some food that was thrown to the pigs to eat. Now I need to remind you that this man was a Jew and pigs were unclean. This young man was absolutely miserable in the far country. Absolutely miserable. Finally, he said to himself, my father has many servants who have plenty to eat and here I am starving. I will go back to my father and tell him how I have sinned and I will tell him I'm not worthy to be his son and would like to be one of his servants. And we all know the story. The father longed for his son to come home and he was waiting for him. He watched every day and then one day in the distance the father saw a man coming and he could see that that man was ragged. And soon the father recognized the young man as his son. And running out to meet him, the father threw his arms around the boy. And the boy said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice, notice that the boy called him father. That's all important. As dirty and as filthy as that boy got, he never became a pig, but he had to get out of the pig pen. He was always a son of the father, but he had to say, I will arise and go to my father. But before the son could finish, the father ordered his servants to bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Prepare a feast. Let us eat and rejoice for the son who I thought was dead is alive. He was lost, but now he is found and all the household rejoice. Folks, the only way a child of God that has been to the far country can get back into fellowship in the father's house is by repentance and confession. I hope we understand that. A sinning child cannot have fellowship with God and be in a place of service without first getting clean. Turn with me to John chapter 14. I want to illustrate this. John chapter 14. I need to illustrate this. John 14, starting in verse 4, Starting in verse 4, he, that is Jesus, riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And after he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded, then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. And Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean. You see, our Lord 
who was once girt, who once girded himself with a towel and washed the feet of his disciples is still the one girded with the towel of service who washes the feet of every child of God that has been to the far country and repents. Only then will the Father say, without hesitation, might I add, only then will the Father say without hesitation, I will bring you back into the place of fellowship and usefulness. Listen to what John has to say to Christians in 1 John chapter 1. Now, 1 John 1, 9, we all know it, right? John is talking about Christians here. We tend to kind of skip over verses 5 through 8. So let me read 5 through 9. This, then, is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, he's talking to Christians here, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 8, will you listen? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Then, he says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that, that doesn't mean simply to say, I'm sorry, or I apologize, and be done with it. The word translated confess here in 1 John 1, 9 means, and this is strong medicine, to say the same thing that God says about your sin. And if you want to know what God thinks about your sin, look at the cross. God the Father laid your sin and my sin on his son and punished it. Oh, surely God the Father was not responsible for bruising his own son. Well, listen to what the Bible says in Isaiah. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. God the Father tells us that he is responsible. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him, that is Jesus, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Look at verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. By the way, that's the condition of humanity. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, the Lord hath laid on him, that is Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Then look in verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, that is Jesus. He hath put him to grief, when thou, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. God the Father laid your sin and my sin on his son and punished it. That's what, that's what God thinks about sin. God can't even look upon sin. In those final three hours when Jesus was on the cross, God the Father pulled a curtain of darkness around the cross, and Psalm 22, verse 1 says this, tell us, uh, Psalm, it tells us, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Folks, sin, no matter how small you think it is, is serious business. Are you living in a far country? Miserable, out of fellowship with God? Turn to God who is faithful and just. 
He's the only one whose justice includes grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Look with me at Deuteronomy. Interestingly enough, some Old Testament verses. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Lamentations. There's a book that we probably don't look at very often. Lamentations, chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23 says this. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. He is the only one whose justice includes grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And why can he do that? Because his son paid the price. God the Father put your sin and mine on his son and punished it. And he can offer grace, mercy, and forgiveness to all that call upon him. One final thought that I would like to share in closing. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. This is the commissioning of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. This is Isaiah, he, he's writing this. Isaiah ch chapter 6, verses 1, I'll read through verse 8. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. One cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the, with tongs from the, off the altar, and he laid it upon my, my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Whom will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Now folks, Isaiah was one of the biggest men to walk across the pages of scripture. And I don't know about you, but my walk doesn't even come close when compared to the life of Isaiah. Yet when Isaiah saw the Lord's holiness and the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up, what did he do? He found it necessary to repent. He turned to God. Verses 5 through 7 says, Woe is me, for I am I'm undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. From not, mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Notice here that Isaiah did not pray corporately for the sin of the people, he prayed for the forgiveness of his own sin. The point that I'm trying to make here is simply this. The Lord did not call Isaiah, and Isaiah did not hear God's call until he repented. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? Then said I, here I am. 
send me. Folks, are you wondering why God hasn't called you? Are you wondering why you haven't heard God's call? Are you wondering why the heavens seem like brass when you pray and there's no revival? Perhaps you're living in a far country. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. I'd like to read to you a song, or the lyrics of a song, that I heard first many, many years ago. It's sung by a husband and wife team, Steve and Annie Chapman. The lyrics are written by a man whose name is Michael Booth. I had a good friend of mine that actually introduced me to Steve and Annie Chapman, my friend Bill Ryan. Let me read the lyrics. My heart is like a house. One day I let the Savior in. There are many rooms where we, would, where we would visit now and then, but then one day he saw that door, and I knew the day had come too soon. I said, Jesus, I'm not ready for us to visit in that room, because it's a place in my heart where even I don't go. I have some things hidden there that I don't want anyone to know. But he handed me the key, and with tears of love on his face, he said, I want to make you clean. Let me go to, into your secret place. So I opened up the door, and as the two of us walked in, I was so ashamed, his light revealed my hidden sin. Folks, hidden sin here on earth is open scandal in heaven. You need to understand that. But when I think about that room now, I'm not afraid anymore because I know my hidden sin no longer hides behind that door. That was a place in my heart where I, even I wouldn't go. I had some things hidden there that I didn't want anybody to know, but he handed me the key with tears of love on his face and he made me clean. I let him in my secret place. Is there a place in your heart that even you won't go? Folks, if you're living in a far country, and you know if you are, turn to God. Say, I will arise and go to my Father. Don't delay. Don't put it off. He's the only one that can offer you. His justice includes forgiveness and grace and mercy. His Son paid the penalty, the price, and He can extend that to you and to me as His children. Go to the one who, who can and will forgive you and make it right. Turn with me to Psalm 51. This is David's great confession after his sin with Bathsheba. Notice what he says. Psalm chapter 51, verses 1 and 2. David says this, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy, to thy loving kindness, According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me th thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Folks, confess your sin to the only one that can restore your fellowship and put you in a place of service and usefulness again. Look at verses 12 and 13 of that same chapter. David says this, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He never lost his salvation. But he said, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And folks, that is sweet fellowship with the Savior. And then drop down to verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. And folks, that's being restored once again to a place of surf service and usefulness. Perhaps you're here tonight and you're not saved. 
we read from Isaiah 53, verses 4, 6, and 10, it tells us that God the Father laid your sin and mine on his Son and punished it. Folks, if God did, didn't spare his own Son, then what about you? What about me? Do you think you can escape? The writer of Hebrews actually answers that question. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. It's actually a question without an answer. Hebrews 2, 3. Remember, God laid your sin and mine on his son and punished it. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? The answer is there's no way to escape, escape if we neglect so great a salvation. That's the answer. God's provided. He's done it all. There's nothing in you and me that appeals to God. We're sinners. We're all sinners. What appeals to God is his son and what he sees in him. Jesus himself gives us the remedy when he assured his disciples in that familiar passage of John chapter 14. I think we all know it. We can all say it. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that makes John 3.16 all important. And again, you all know this is my favorite verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 